Hello. Okay. Good afternoon to everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, to welcome everybody, and especially to welcome Professor Hendricks. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to listen to him today and to see you again, Professor George. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, accepting our invitation to, to be here and to talk about uh, governance of agricultural cooperatives. It's a very important topic. And just uh, I'd like to make a brief introduction to, to everybody. Uh, professor George Hendricks is a professor of the economics of organizations at the Department of Organization and Personal Management, uh, Rotterdam School of Management, Erasmus University, and his teaching and research address the organization of enterprises. Important themes are the ownership of enterprise with an emphasis on cooperatives, organizational design, governance, collective decision making, delegation, remuneration schemes, selection, coordination, and cognition. And game theory uh, serves as the main tool of analysis. And Professor Hendricks has published several articles, papers in highly qualified journals regarding governance of agricultural cooperatives besides books and chapters. So, like I said before, it's a great pleasure to have you here and to listen to you to this, in this Congress, this conference. Thank you very much. And uh, I can, you can start whenever you want, Professor George. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Silvia. Um, it's good to be back uh, in Brazil. It's uh, yes. online at this time. I looked it up uh, 20 years ago, was my first visit to Brazil, to Ribeirão Preto, to uh, the Cooperative Center. And since then I have uh, five, six more, I've had five, six more visits to Brazil. And it was always a pleasure uh, to be there. Um, today I will talk uh, about uh, the management of cooperatives. I changed the title a little bit to give it a little bit more focus. And I, I give the title management of interfirm cooperatives because nowadays we see many, many different types of cooperatives, also many citizen cooperatives in Brazil and in the Netherlands and other types of cooperatives. So that's why I did choose, uh, I changed it to this uh, title. So management, so uh, it's in the title. So where's management about in the end? I think it's uh, uh, about realizing the goals of the owners uh, of the enterprise. So let's uh, look a little bit then what this entails uh, in a cooperative. Yeah, so ownership of enterprise, uh, owners have a large impact uh, on the enterprise. We see that at least in the Netherlands, in the news about uh, Twitter and Elon Musk, the new owner uh, has a big impact on the enterprise. And it goes very fast there, but also in many other enterprises, this has a big impact uh, over decades, over centuries. So let's think about owners of enterprise as uh, one of, uh, there are many stakeholders to an enterprise, employees, suppliers, consumers, the government, investors, and so on. And one of these stakeholders, for example, an investor, a private equity investor could own the enterprise. But the topic for today is really a supplier in the supply chain, uh, owning uh, the enterprise in an adjacent stage in the supply chain. And so let's see, uh, I will come back to that a little bit uh, later. Uh, does it matter? Yeah, does ownership matter? Do we see uh, different enterprises being owned by different parties? Now in the Netherlands, the uh, institutional structure of production, the ownership of enterprises is diverse, like in my, most countries, we see just a very, very few uh, publicly listed enterprises in the Netherlands, just 140, and they get all the attention in terms of research because lots of data is available. But there are many more cooperatives, 4,700 cooperatives. There are more than a quarter million family-owned enterprises. There are 150,000 foundations and so on. And these all, these, all these organizational forms, uh, except the publicly listed ones, 
don't receive that much attention, but they are very important in terms of value creation. Now, the cooperatives that I uh, study together uh, with uh, Professor Silvia in Brazil, they're everywhere. And say, like in China, they are big, many small cooperatives in the European Union. From Brazil, I, uh, I looked up the uh, Brazilian cooperative organization, OCB, and they list 1,600 cooperative members of their uh, organization. There, there, probably there will be more, but still it gives you an indication about uh, these enterprises. Are they small? Now in China, for example, they are often small, but uh, there's a lot of variety. Let's say, let's, let's see, uh, have a look at four Dutch cooperatives. Say Friesland Campina is a dairy cooperative. It has about uh, 16,000 members and an annual turnover of uh, about 12 billion euros. Flora Holland, a flower cooperative, uh, and I will come back to this cooperative uh, later in the stock, has about 3,500 members and an annual turnover of 5.6 billion euros. Then there's a vegetable cooperative, just having four vegetables, a uh, harvest house, uh, say cucumbers, peppers, and uh, are the biggest one, are just 50 members. But these 50 members have a turnover of 900 million euros. So it's huge. And then here I list also a, a pharmacist cooperative, Mosadex, having 300 members, 300 pharmacists owning the cooperative. And they have a turnover of about 2 billion euros. So they're very big uh, cooperatives around, but also very many small ones. Now for a cooperative to uh, to do well, uh, there's always a choice for uh, for uh, in terms of ownership of enterprise. For a cooperative to do well, it must at least as create create at least as much values as other organizational forms. And the comparison is usually uh, at least as much value as enterprises owned by investors. Yeah, and the big thing, the big difference between uh, agricultural cooperatives, supply chain cooperatives, is that the members not only own the enterprise, but also have an intense uh, transaction relationship with the enterprise. How do cooperatives do? Overall, uh, they exist and thrive, and gradually, over decades, you see that they gradually uh, gain market share, and that these market shares are a little bit larger in advanced economies than in less developed economies. And what we do in terms of the research, we compare uh, investor-owned firms with uh, firms owned by buyers or suppliers in a supply chain in order to determine, in order to explain why there are so many cooperatives around, what is the source of value creation of these, uh, the, the, this ownership structure. So let's uh, dive a little bit uh, deeper into this. And let's first look at, um, um, I don't know whether you see my entire screen. Yes, there it is. Um, so what's a cooperative? So I think about the supply chain. Here I depicted five stages. And let's say the grow the harvest stage here, but it can really be, be many different things. It can be flowers, it can be uh, fruits and vegetables, and it, it can be many different things. There are usually many small parties or there are many parties around at a specific stage in the supply ch chain. And it turns out that these parties at say these farmers, they often join together in a society of members and then they arrange all kinds of things that are beneficial to them, countervailing power, but also they learn from each other. Uh, there's all kinds of social capital, uh, all kinds of benefits in the society of members, but also often this society of members integrates either backward or forward in the supply chain. And say here a supplier cooperative integrates forward into processing. For example, Friesland Campina uh, integrates forward in it. It has built up during a century, a huge processing plant 
And this huge processing plant having a turnover of 11 billion euros is owned by the Society of Members. And similarly for Flower Holland, they, uh, uh, they really, uh, uh, the importance of this cooperative is, is making a sales channel available. They own the auction clock, they own the entire infrastructure in order to bring the flowers and the plants to the clock. And this results in a turnover of, in an enterprise having a turnover of 5.6 billion euros each year. Now, and so what's a cooperative? It consists of a society of members so, uh, and an enterprise where the society of members, that this one unit, owns uh, this enterprise. Now, what's now the, what should then be, or what's then the nature of value creation in these cooperatives? In my view, there are three sources of value creation in this, uh, in a cooperative. First, uh, value creation at the level of the society of members. The, the, the members uh, have joined in an organization, a union, a society, and there's a benefit of joining this this society. Then there's the exchange relationship. Yeah, so here the yellow arrow, the transaction relationship between the members and the cooperative enterprise. So there may be many sources of value creation. And finally, the cooperative enterprise, by virtue of being owned by this adjacent stage in the production chain, may give it a competitive advantage in the com competition with other enterprises. So and I list here lots of benefits uh, that may arise from these three sources, uh, these three sources of value creation. And in terms of the society of members, you may think of countervailing power, which I mentioned, but also coordination, horizontal between the members in terms of delivering the harvest to uh, the processing plant, the pooling issues, the learning benefits, uh, establishing focus, cooperative principles, all these ideas may be valuable, may, may create value in just the society of members. But usually this is st uh, still limited. Say the, the big thing in terms of value creation, the big thing seems to be often the exchange relationship. Yeah, there are uh, a number of very important uh, advantages, possible advantages, uh, market access and assurance, uh, payment assurance, the elimination of double marginalization at, in the exchange relationship, trust may develop, long-term relationships, price volatility, now is the energy, use energy, vo price volatility, yeah, there the co-op may serve a role, and so on. And finally, the cooperative enterprise may provide lots of member services, yeah, uh, that the society of members likes to receive uh, the delivery and purchase requirement may be important in the competitive process. The single origin constraint may give a commitment to certain products. Tax benefits are important. Uh, okay, so many sources of value. So these are all uh, important uh, in order to understand an enterprise, it's always good to go a little bit more into detail uh, about what, who is the owner, what is a farmer. Yeah, and a farmer, uh, a member, has many things associated with him, his farmhouse, his family, uh, his education, his country, uh, other ownership of assets, he owns his own land, maybe he's a member of other cooperatives, and so on. Yeah, so there are many aspects of a farmer and lots of the analysis uh, of cooperatives goes back to the farmer. Who is the farmer? Uh, is there maybe an age problem that uh, the cooperative shares are not transferable to uh, the next, or it's hard to transfer them to other farmers or to the next generation? Um, so you have always to think uh, about who is this farmer about his beliefs, about how the world works? Does he own other crops? Uh, um, how is his relationship 
with the other members in the society of members. So a farmer uh, in a society of uh, members um, has there a stake, but always keep in mind, you have to keep in mind that there are many things outside, yeah, uh, outside this relationship between the farmer member and a specific cooperative, and that may have a huge impact on the behavior of the cooperative. Going back to uh, management of cooperatives, well, in the end, the cooperative aims uh, at realizing the goals of the members. Yeah, so the uh, the cooperative enterprise, yeah, uh, the manager of the enterprise has to think about what is valuable for the members. Now, let's look at a specific cooperative. Uh, say, I mentioned here already uh, the Royal Flora Holland, this uh, plant flower cooperative. Yeah, and the goal here is very simple, an optimal price for the growers and market access for the growers. And the enterprise uh, has 2,700 employees. Yeah, so it's just a regular enterprise uh, having to do all kinds of logistics, uh, making transactions feasible, uh, financial payments have to be arranged, and so on. Um, so it's a, bit, a substantial enterprise with uh, a large turnover. But this is the management is kind of complicated because the owners are quite different. Yeah. So the smallest owner, the smallest member in this cooperative, has an annual turnover of 20,000 euros. The largest member yeah, has an annual turnover of 100 million euros. Yeah, so that's why I gave this title the talk, the management of inter-firm cooperatives. Yeah, these members, these member firms are kind of enterprises and all these enterprises have joined in a society of members at, in order to advance their interests somehow. So this is already difficult, uh, the, the, the size differences, but then there are plant and flower growers and plants are quite different than flowers. Yeah, Flowers are very perishable and have to go fast. And they usually, uh, 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 well, plants are different. They tailor more uh, to uh, individual interest. Uh, people feel more attached, somehow are uh, willing to pay much more for a tree to plant in uh, in 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 your garden uh, rather than than flowers, and next to the members there are also external suppliers. Yeah, so most of the turnover is from the members, the internal suppliers, ninety four percent, but still there are six percent supply by external members uh, who uh, don't have an ownership relationship with the enterprise. No, no the wrong. Uh, uh, Button. What you see in terms of sales channels, so making the market accessible for uh, the members, we see here two types of uh, sales channels in this cooperative nowadays. Traditionally, the auction clock, and there the, the, uh, the, the auction or the Dutch auction as you start with a high price, and in the end, who first calls yes gets. Uh, the flowers or the plants at 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 the uh, at the price indicated by the clock, but they have erected uh, uh, five years ago. They started a big digital platform, and the and the and the members, the farmers, invested one hundred million euros in this digital platform in order to be uh, a flower plant platform that serves uh, sellers and buyers worldwide. And you see here big differences that the flower growers mainly use the auction clock, where the plant growers mainly go for the digital platform. So there's a big difference. Uh, again, more heterogeneity in this cooperative, and this somehow has to be managed. Now, where's the superior value creation in this cooperative? Surprisingly, in this uh, cooperative, there is no value creation in the society of members. The members hardly know each other. They don't hardly communicate with each other. And the reason is that this cooperative has about 10,000 varieties 
of plants and flowers. So they are not competing with each other. They don't have products that are similar to each other. Uh, each um, uh, grower has about 100 varieties and they conclude contracts or they conclude exchanges with individual buyers. Yeah, and so uh, these members, they know everything about their own plants and flowers, but you also know the market very well. There's no countervailing power because there's just too much variety in this cooperative. Whereas uh, what is very important uh, for the members is the logistics, the standardization in terms of logistics, the payment security. If a big problem in cooperatives is often payment uh, of uh, for transactions. And what this cooperative has established is very valuable. Once you push uh, the button in the Dutch, Dutch auction, then immediately the next second, the money is withdrawn from the account of the buyer. So no delays in payment and say in many countries, in many markets, that's a big, big problem. But here this has been resolved. And now nowadays you see new enterprises and change emer emerging dealing with this, but this cooperative has handled this itself. Administration, administration handling shouldn't be underestimated. Each transaction, there are many aspects to it. They have, they have to be recorded uh, and so on for all kinds of reasons. It's uh, intensive. Uh, it's also challenging for this cooperative because they have two systems of transaction handling around, one for the clock and one for the digital platform. And this is uh, a pain uh, for, for the internal uh, management of this cooperative. And they try to move to a uniform standardized system, but this goes uh, slow. Old farmers don't like to change. The new farmers, they like to go digital. And uh, so there's a lot of value creation at the exchange relationship. But the cooperative, and the cooperative enterprise is also very valuable. It turns out that this cooperative enterprise provides 150 types of services to the members from very general services in terms of lobbying with the government about uh, yeah, uh, how, to go, how to go about plans in Corona time, uh, all kinds of uh, health issues with plants, um, also services towards individual members in terms of uh, plant or uh, flower information, uh, many, many uh, things. So uh, member services, many of these services would not be provided by, by a private equity or an enterprise. Here they are provided and create a lot of value for the members because it's member owned, this enterprise, it's farmer owned. And so the enterprise it provides all kinds of services uh, for them. Now, what's the big uh, the strategy here, crudely, is to go from a physical marketplace, an auction clock, to a digital business to business platform. Yeah, and really to make the transition, yeah, uh, is uh, difficult. Yeah, even for you and me learning new, uh, new software systems and so on, takes a little bit of time or a lot of time. And this variety you see also within this uh, cooperative that uh, um, the platform principles yeah, do not always coincide, uh, are not aligned with the auction clock principles. And so there for the management, a big issue is how to go, uh, how to make this, uh, make this transition. So managerial challenges, um, uh, yeah, so uh, there's a big infrastructure at Flora Holland, so they have uh, uh, yeah, uh, huge properties yeah, to, to handle the logistics, uh, to bring the plants to the clock and then distribute uh, the plants and the flowers from the clock to the buyers. So many, many trucks and uh, issues are involved in dealing with this every day. So every morning there's the auction clock from uh, during three hours to concentrate buyers and suppliers. But then uh, well, how 
are these costs of all this infrastructure divided between all the members? Is it fair yeah, that the digital uh, members yeah, still pay for the logistics infrastructure? Similarly, for the benefits, yeah, so uh, uh, they had a, a very nice year, uh, say in 2021, yeah, uh, the annual turnover increased from 4.8 million, million to 5.6 million. So a huge increase. Uh, how to distribute the joint benefits, large members, small members, uh, plant growers, flower growers, and so on. Um, other issues, yeah, the standardization, I mentioned this, the standardization of various administrative processes, the transition management. What about further additional forward integration, maybe into logistics? Yeah, nowadays we have all the at home delivery of packages uh, for uh, all kinds of things you, you buy at internet. Why is this cooperative not doing this? Yeah. And so they are considering this, they are logistic masters. Yeah, they have all this experience from these 10,000 plant varieties. Uh, they could handle a lot, lot of, okay, so that's an issue. What about retail? Say most plants are nowadays sold at IKEA. I think it's also in, the, in the Brazil. Yeah, and so somehow I, IKEA takes uh, a large share of the value creation in the chain. Yeah, why not? Yeah, so somehow skip yeah, one of the retail stages. Yeah, and so, but that requires huge investments. Uh, and so many nice issues around uh, to think about uh, cooperatives, big challenges for the management. Now, I visited a number of times in Brazil, and there are huge uh, differences in Brazil, say, southern Brazil is like the Netherlands. Yeah, their farmers have about uh, 100 hectares on average. In Mato Grosso del Sul, where uh, Professor Silvia uh, is doing her research, it's uh, their uh, farms are larger, and that, but there are still, still uh, quite uh, some cooperatives. But in Mato Grosso, there are incredibly large farms, and there are hardly any cooperatives. Yeah, or well, that's what I understood during my last visit, and so. Um, the question is why uh, is that a lost opportunity for the farmers in Mato Grosso, or is there something else? Uh, is there no value creation possible for cooperatives? So issues uh, to think about. And so the cooperative challenge, uh, where what makes management of these cooperatives so difficult, is that on the one hand you have to uh, to run an enterprise. You have to Run, you have to manage the 2,700 employees at, at Royal Flower Holland. You have to run this cooperative enterprise. But on the other hand, you have to also uh, govern and deal with, of course, the owners, the society of members. And so a manager of a cooperative uh, uh, has to be able to do things to, to be able to function in two worlds. Uh, being in one organization, yeah, the cooperative enterprise, uh, this business is like a regular regular enterprise, but there's a specific type of owner, yeah, uh, where these owners have this transaction relationship with the cooperative enterprise. And so here's uh, I have uh, uh, this picture here of Tini Sanders. He's an interesting guy because he was a manager of a family-owned enterprise making the Mars uh, candy bars. Uh, he was uh, uh, a CEO, a manager at uh, Campina, the, uh, now it's Friesland Campina, so uh, two dairy cooperatives merged into uh, uh, Friesland Campina. He was the former chair of Campina. And after his Campina time, after the merger, he had to look for a new job. And he became manager of the soccer club uh, PSV Eindhoven, yeah, one of the three major soccer clubs in the Netherlands. And so I asked him, what, um, what is the difference between these three enterprises with these three uh, different owners? And he said, well, 50% of my time, it doesn't matter. I have to run the enterprise. I have to run uh, uh, to handle, to manage 
like 2,700 employees think about operations, about finance, so on, but the other 50% I interact with the owners yeah, and, and the, at his uh, Campina time. He did a lot of uh, farm visits, listened to farmer concerns and problems and so on. So you have to be able to handle those. Now, what makes now, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so in terms of value creation, yeah, you think about, uh, I go a little bit up. Yes, so why now, when does now um, a cooperative create more value than say having two separate private equity owned enterprises upstream and downstream, yeah, instead of one forward integrated enterprise, the cooperative. And uh, the source has to be somehow synergies, yeah, and so with, with a colleague, I, I we established a result that you need at least a, a, a certain amount of synergy. Without synergy, a cooperative will not uh, survive the competitive process. There has to be somewhere synergy in this cooperative in order to do as well as two separate uh, investor-owned enterprises. Now, thinking about this, uh, I go back to uh, some old idea of, uh, of Simon about uh, decomposability. Yeah, and systems yeah, uh, have faced lots of interactions, but larger systems have many more interactions. So what you usually see is that you get units, you get decomposability within systems. You have various stages in the supply chain. And uh, for each stage, you have lots of interactions within the stage, but limited interactions with the other stages. And in terms of uh, management, yeah, having a larger system, having more components, the number of uh, interdependencies explodes and quickly, uh, yeah, you, you come to limits in terms of the size of enterprises. Yeah, and say here, let's think here about two stages in the supply chain. So I have here a member, yeah, uh, depicted by the, uh, having a number of tasks, say grow plants. Uh, in terms of a uh, flower cooperative, you have your greenhouse, the glass, uh, the water you need, and so on. Financial issues, so many things, and they all relate to each other. So lots of crosses, lots of interactions within the farm. Then there is uh, a transaction uh, uh, relationship, and there a number of things have to be matched, have to be coordinated. And finally, there is a uh, a cooperative enterprise, and again, in this, uh, with these 2,700 employees, a flower, a lot, lots of interactions within the enterprise that have to be brought to value. Synergies have to be created there. And so, in such a system, yeah, do it make sense to have a supply chain where there are no cooperatives? Unless, yeah, the green crosses, yeah, there are always linkages. These green crosses are very important. Yeah, so how important are the synergies created between the upstream and the downstream stage in the supply chain? Yeah, and the source of value within this uh, within these cooperatives, either internally between all the members. I've depicted here only one member. So, and this is relevant for uh, Flora Holland because the society of members creates no value. But in terms of the transaction relationship and the relationship with the cooperative enterprise, there are many synergies that uh, are brought to value by uh, a uh, well-functioning cooperative. Yeah, and so here the logic is that the value of these green axes, yeah, uh, has to be sufficiently large, yeah, in order to uh, have a healthy competitive cooperative. Yeah, so uh, the management, yeah, next to bring the blue crosses to value, organize your enterprise well, you have to bring also green access to value. And there are a number of ways, and I'm just very general here about this, yeah, uh, what to do here. 
uh, what's a big issue right now in Flora Holland is really thinking about restructuring the transfer price system, the tariff system within the cooperative, how much do uh, small members, large members pay, uh, the, the clock uh, users versus the digital platform users, and so on. So that's a big issue, and that's uh, a cl the classic topic of contract design, where you structure the payoffs. But also nowadays, we see a lot of attention for information design. And we see that in all these worldwide elections, yeah, like the, in the US uh, yesterday, and what we heard before that, and maybe you had it in your recent election, I don't know. But there is uh, lots of things going on in terms of information design about a kind of channeling, choosing, manipulating information structures. And that may have a big impact on, uh, on decisions. So uh, to conclude, uh, I think I, I've used up almost my half an hour. So superior value creation in cooperatives yeah, is really bringing uh, synergies to life. You really create value uh, in terms of the possible synergies that are around, and they may reside in the organization of the society of members. And I've here discussed uh, Flora Holland a little bit, but all the cooperatives, they have many more interactions. They have interactions, uh, strong interactions within the society of members. The exchange relationship, I think, naturally due to the uh, transaction relationship within the supply chain must create a lot of value. And there are many possibilities for doing this. But finally, also, the cooperative enterprise, by having an adjacent stage being the owner, may give the cooperative enterprise a commitment in, a, in co competitive processes that makes them a fierce competitor in a, a competitive process. Um, now, from uh, I have made it to conclude, cooperatives are beautiful to study. And I have here a conference back from a previous in-person conference uh, where uh, this was uh, printed on the back. And so um, that's how I feel about it. It's nice to study them, uh, not just to study them, but also to really to uh, create a lot of value for small or large far farmers specifically, but in value in supply chains in general. Okay, um, that's it for today. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Hey, George, thank you very much for your speech, your lecture. Uh, always you are talking about some uh, insights you have, and I, I took note of some aspects. But I, I want to know if they are, we have uh, some questions from the audience. I, I can see here the, the guy who's helped me is hosting this conference, this, this room. Is there any questions from the audience? I don't know. Let me I, I don't have access to the... Let me see if I have... No, I don't have the access to the chat. Let me see. No. Yes, just because I have some questions. But first, I'd like to know if there's some questions from the audience. I noticed that there is one comment in the chat. Um, oh no, that's just your question. Uh, any questions? Yeah, there's any questions. Uh, I don't know, the El Velton, I think is the name of the, the professor who is with us hosting this event. Is there any questions? I don't know. But I have some questions for George. Uh, you're talking about, I think, was quite interesting to talk about that uh, cooperative which involved uh, with uh, flowers and uh, the market of flowers and uh, trading flowers and plants, like you said, and talk about the phenomenon of the digital phenomenon. I'm uh, paying attention to this, related to the difference between the marketplace, uh, a physical marketplace, and the digital business-to-business -business platform. 
and how this new issue uh, is changing a lot in the world, especially in cooperatives. And uh, I'd like to to listen to something regarding to communication about the digital communication. What's your perception or your view about the role of digital communication and information technology nowadays in Netherlands in order to, to enhance or to improve the governance? Thinking about society of members and also the exchange relationship with the, with the enterprise. What would your expectation about that? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the the members, the farm, uh, the growers in this cooperative, they, uh, I think, they anticipated uh, kind of early that uh, this is where the world is going. And, uh, the world is going digital to a large extent, and it took them a while to co to convince all the members that they should invest a huge amount of money in building this platform. But that's what they did in the end, and they are very happy about that. It is nowadays they see that yeah, uh, this was a good uh, good choice. Um, um, but there, there are many things involved in such a platform, yeah. And I uh, say there are concerns or uh, about, for example, um, say one big advantage of the auction clock was price transparency. Uh, everybody could see the price and this really was uh, setting the price also outside the, the cooperative. So there you had this competitive yardstick ID. Uh, retail, yeah, doesn't like that too much. So they really try to kill the auction clock. Yeah, and, uh, and more generally, uh, they uh, like they do not like the countervailing power of cooperatives. It's not a big issue, the countervailing power in this cooperative, but price formation is very important. And within the platform, uh, you can make many choices. Yeah, and right now the, uh, the platform is arranged in such a way uh, that individual growers conclude deals with individual retailers, but the price that is established thus is not known to other growers. Yeah, the growers are not uh, uh, yet there to share the price information. And I think this is really harmful for them, but it could be very easily changed yeah, within the platform uh, and by members allowing uh, yeah, prices to be shared and that would again i think move some power back to uh, in terms of uh, power over the price to the farmers um so there are many peculiarities or many choices you you can make in terms of the design of your platform and of course there's all kinds of communication uh, possible uh, but in the end you have to think here about the goal of this cooperative, and it's really uh, um, uh, market access and price formation. Market access, I think, is is nice. They uh, um, they really have a much bigger audience, uh, much many more markets that they that they can tailor to. They have also more members from uh, nowadays members from Italy, from uh, from Kenya and Africa. Uh, and so uh, German flower growers. So it's easier to attract more uh, members, but still uh, there I think the communication is important and digital communication can facilitate a lot. Uh, but um, I think that they can still do much more in terms of uh, educating members, uh, disseminating in information, uh, also really educate uh, farmers in these new technologies. Yeah, they would, farmers would not do it on their own, but if it is in the perception of, uh, an indiv if it is made uh, available within uh, the cooperative, then they all pay for it. And then it's 
for free available once you are a member. You, you pay for it by a membership fee, but why not then use it? So there uh, also many things uh, are possible, but not, I think, uh, used uh, in its entirety yet uh, by here this cooperative, but really many organizations. So um, many, uh, I think many details uh, of these platforms uh, can be chosen. And I'm convinced that the choices would be quite different when uh, a private equity partner, and that was a question five years ago, should we outsource this site? Should we ask private equity to come in and build this uh, site? They would, they make quite different choices, I think than uh, when uh, here uh, this platform is uh, member owned. Uh, I think that's quite interesting, this aspect of these new technologies and how cooperatives are handling these challenges uh, related to enhanced cooperation uh, from the horizontal side and also from the vertical side. And I have a question here from Lucio Barbosa, and uh, I would like to know if you can share the presentation with them. Uh, sure, I've sent the presentation to you, but uh, feel free to send me an email at, uh, oh yeah, I did, didn't put it here. So my email is just G by, from George, and then Hendrikse, just no dot, and G Hendrikse at mm -hmm. RSM, Rotterdam School of Management, dot okay. NL. So feel okay. free uh, uh, to send me an email or ask Sylvia okay. to send okay. it to you. Okay, I will send them the, your email and maybe uh, you can exchange this presentation. And uh, another aspect I think is quite interesting because you said about the Brazilian cooperatives. You were with us, with us here in the Midwest of Brazil, in Mato Grosso do Sul, and we have the opportunity to talk about uh, the profile of cooperatives in this region where we have large farmers. And uh, you talked about um, Mato Grosso with, like I said, really, really large farms. And uh, it's interesting because they are, uh, they increase the interest about uh, the cooperatives in this region, but they are mainly interested in uh, pulling efforts to buy inputs and to sell the outputs to traders and the traders they export the the soya or the corn or the cotton whatever it is the output and uh, by starting to realize the importance of being together and uh, the gain of uh, cooperation even with large farmers and uh, one problem that we have here is, is the distance between the farmers and enterprise, the cooperative. And uh, I think that's not exactly the problem that you have to face in the Netherlands. You have it's a, a small country, and you have a really large country, large regions. And uh, you said something about information design. So in your opinion, what's the importance of uh, this exchange of information between the society of members and the cooperatives in order to make them understand the power of cooperation more than them? the opportunity of uh, aggregating value on the northern states of production. For example, we start processing some type of the product they produce on the farm. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, indeed, in the um, Mato Grosso, that's what I understood, say the distances are very large. Yes. Yeah, so, um, um, uh, digitally, this is of course uh, no problem, but um, if uh, just for many uh, many aspects of say soya and so on, what could suppose say we have here the say we have both in a harvest house and in a royal floor, so the the vegetable cooperative harvest house, there are a few very large members. Yeah, say having an annual turnover of 50 million to 100 million euros. Um, still they join in this cooperative. And then uh, 
And similarly in Flora Holland. So you have also there a very large uh, a member, 100 million euro tech turnovers. But this sounds large, but if you then think about retail, they, they, they say Flora Holland is dealing with uh, retailers who have a turnover of 2 billion. Yeah. And so then even the largest member is not that large for the retailer. Yeah. And so there, just countervailing power is already important. In terms of the distances, again, uh, cooperatives can do a lot in terms of the transfer prices. Say, like, if you have a sugar beet cooperative, that's maybe like a soya cooperative, that um, it, uh, they have to bring their soya, I guess, to a processing plant, and uh, it has to be processed. The cooperative can decide uh, what to do in terms of uh, the transportation cost. So uh, do you, as a cooperative, and some cooperatives do this, that say, we reimburse all the transportation costs, uh, and then uh, we, we give uh, everybody an average price because the distant members are also needed to really uh, use all the capacity of the sugar refinery plant. Uh, that's what some cooperatives do. Other cooperatives have no. If you uh, if you have bad luck, you live far away from the processing plant. You have to pay yourself. So again, there you can make choices as a cooperative to deal with that. And um, I think both, we can do either one. I think most important in the end is, can you create together, first of all, more value by organizing yourself as a cooperative? And once you have created the value, you have to decide how to divide it up. And then you can reimburse for a distance or not. And uh, similarly, you have to make visible uh, within the cooperative to communicate where are the synergies, yeah? Uh, what are, say, uh, these very large farmers in, um, uh, in Mato Grosso that can do many things themselves, but maybe they can lobby for a joint infrastructure uh, by the government, yeah, uh, for uh, I don't know, nice roads or, or other things. That, uh, that sounds very basic, but uh, still, it's not always clear that this is provided. Say many cooperatives in, in the US, in, 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 uh, in the Midwest, they were created uh, electricity co uh, cooperatives because uh, private equity -owned, investor owned firms were not willing to provide electricity. In, in, in the countryside. And then the farmers or the, the, the citizens organize it themselves. And I think there uh, also uh, there's a role to think about these basic uh, member services uh, that uh, are even for very large farmers may be very valuable. So I think you really have to think about uh, what can we learn? What can you learn from each other in the society of members? Is there something? Still, you may be very large, but I think the exporter is probably many, many times larger. Yeah, and uh, uh, but you may even think about forward integration in, into exports. And so, uh, and then you have to think about yeah, where are the synergies? And and that's what I would uh, uh, communicate and really put a price on each of these services provided to make visible to the members, what's the price, yeah? Uh, what's the value created to you by becoming a member? Okay, uh, I have just one more question. Let me see if there's one here. No, um, you know, we are facing a very challenging world. We have uh, new technologies, a uh, new geopolitical configuration in the world and uh, we have a lot of problems related to bankruptcy in the, not on cooperatives but enterprise as general and uh, what is your understanding about the resilience of cooperatives agriculture cooperatives in face of this changing world you have farmers 
trying to be more connected. We have new, now nowadays in Brazil, when you think about agriculture purpose, when you think about farmers, they are really worried about uh, the import of fertilizers and the cost of production. And uh, so sometimes they are thinking about the, how to survive to this um, crazy world, a lot of uh, challenges. And what's the role of cooperatives in this new world that we are starting to face in this century? What's your, your opinion, George? Um, yeah, I think uh, the world is always changing and uh, maybe, okay, it looks like very turbulent right now, but uh, I think it seems to me uh, very temporary, the energy uh, uh, price uh, prices. Um, but I think if uh, cooperatives have arisen, uh, always to address some basic needs. Yeah, and if there are uh, uh, big concerns, it's uh, it's natural that you organize, uh, that you communicate, uh, that you share problems and, and find solutions for for the problems you experience, and mm -hmm. you might find them first yourself and just in terms of volatility of prices to make pool uh, in cooperatives pooling is a big thing to mitigate price fluctuations um, but also things in terms of information provision how to deal with new technology sustainability issues legal issues it's all overwhelming for an individual uh, and then i can uh, yeah i think it's yeah, may often be too much for an individual farmer or grower, but once you join forces, uh, you're able, uh, yeah, I think, to handle uh, these issues. Yeah, and in the end, there always has to be uh, food. Yeah, and uh, yeah. If, uh, if if all farmers stop farming, then definitely there's a problem for society. And so farmers have to argue and have to explain their uh, their uh, concerns also with, with uh, society, with the government. Yeah, but first of all, I think they have shown to be able to compete with, uh, with many other types of enterprises successfully, but it takes a considerable effort uh, by the members, but also the management of cooperatives uh, uh, to deal with that. But so I'm overall, uh, uh, I think it's natural that that people organize, whether it's citizens, yeah, in the Netherlands, going for solar panel cooperatives, two or three hundred families in in a small town, going for this. In Brazil, I heard about, uh, uh, yeah, say you have bike sharing arrangements, yeah, mm -hmm. exploited or developed by uh, private equity. But why is this not organized by citizens? Yeah, and mm. uh, issues like that. And um, so, um, but then, yeah, there's still uh, a cooperative is a means of uh, dealing with problems. And if there are other ways than cooperatives, better way than cooperatives, fine. But I think in many, uh, many settings, cooperatives uh, uh, are doing uh, of enterprises owned by an adjacent stage in the production chain. Uh, resolve, uh, deal with many of these uh, problems uh, efficiently. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions from the impersonal audience, as pessoas presenciais, alguma questão, or in the chat here. I send your email to Lucio Barbosa, George, uh, sure. to exchange the presentation. And uh, I don't know if there any, any other question. Uh, just to, okay, just to remember that we have a, um, a questionnaire for the people who are attending this session. So, for favor, responder ao questionário para avaliação da, dessa sessão. And so I invite them to answer this questionnaire in order to, to evaluate, to measure the result of this session. So, if you don't have any other questions, George, I would like to thank you very much. I'd like to see you again in Brazil. Now that yeah. I know, we hope that the pandemic problems, we are 
I don't know, so I don't know, I'm not so sure about that because nowadays we have some no news about in Brazil that uh, you have some cases again, but I hope to see you soon. And sure. uh, if you invite to come to Brazil again. And uh, thank you for everybody who is attending this session. Let me see if there's any other question. No, I think that's, that's it, George. Thank you very much. Hope you have a nice evening. In the okay, Dallas. thank you. I, I miss you a lot. <laughs> you have, you have a, really, really a nice country and uh, the university is fantastic. So it would be nice to meet you again in the Netherlands. <laughs> Same for me. I like to come over again in in person soon, and uh, we'll see. Thank you for having me, and uh, yeah, all the best. Thank you. All the best for you, and a todos uma boa tarde. Muito obrigada pela presença. Aqui tá, ah, here we have the, the link né, to the to, to have this evaluation to measure to this session. Okay, George. Okay. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. All the best for all.